Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canale, and welcome back to Before the Lights podcast, the show that tells you how they made their mark. Today, he was sentenced to life without parole in 1984 on drug charges and is the longest serving first time nonviolent offender in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. He served 32 years, people, and is the most appealed federal prisoner to date. He's known as the Grow Father and is a prolific writer. Let's welcome in George Moderano. George, welcome to the show. Well, hi, everybody. George Moderano on Tommy's show. I'm happy to be here. And what Tommy says is true. I was the first nonviolent offender to get life, no parole. Ladies and gentlemen, life, no parole means you come home in a body bag. There were three prior to me that received life, no parole, and they were Violent repeat offenders. Uh, one was Nicky Barnes. Uh, they made movies about him. He turned informant. One was a dear friend of mine, Herbie Sperling. Uh, Herbie went back with the Murder Incorporated. He drove as a teenager for Murder Incorporated. And uh, he, he died in prison, a good friend of mine. And the other guy was Felix. I don't know his last name, a black guy out of L.A. And he had a major heroin ring. And uh, poor Felix was killed in Leavenworth Prison. Just want to let everybody know that this podcast is listener supported. You can do that many ways by either A, joining the Before the Lights members group. And there's a link in the show notes to that. You can make a donation, just simple donations to a PayPal account. Or you can buy me a glass of wine, just like Bauer UC did. He didn't buy me a glass of wine. He bought me three glasses of wine. So Bauer, thank you so much for being a former guest, for being a listener of the show and supporting the show. Chin Chin, salute to you and salute Chin Chin to you three times. Thank you so much for the support and the vino. You want to join Bauer? Just go to the link in the show notes and you too could buy me a glass of wine. Any type of support for this podcast is appreciated. We are sitting here Recording from Dom DeMarco's Pizzeria and Bar located in Las Vegas, Nevada. If you're from Vegas, you have to get over here on West Charleston, 9785 West Charleston Boulevard. If you're not from Vegas and you're coming to Vegas and you're visiting and you're on the strip and you're going, I'm looking for some good pizza. I'm looking for some good pasta. I want a great happy hour. Dom DeMarco's is the spot. I'm going to help you. I told you it was 9785 West Charleston. But if you go to the show notes, I'm going to put a link right to the website where you can go on there. You can have it delivered if you're not if you're close by. But come check out Dom DeMarco's. We're sitting out here on the patio on January 1. It's a beautiful day out here in Las Vegas. But you'll, you can attest to this. Dom DeMarco's is well, the place. Incidentally, uh, he has the longest happy hour in, in Vegas. I believe he goes from 2 to 6, uh, 50% off on everything from 2 to 6 and very family oriented. You know, if you got a bunch of kids and you want great pizza, great food, uh, well, most important, most important, he he opened his arms to a guy like me. When I came home from prison, he welcomed me to Vegas, and and uh, I, I actually I'm by coastal. I do two months in Philly, New York, and then two months out of the last two years, and he's been my uh, my savior here in Vegas. Let's get back to you and get into your story. You were raised on the 600 block of Fitzwater Street, which was known as Gunman's Row in the 30s and 40s. Oh, yeah, Gunman's Row. Uh, Tell the story, George, the two-year-old of Benny the Gimp. Well, uh, let's little, little back up a little bit about Gunman's Row. Gunman's Row, my 600 block of Fitzwater Street, even though it was residential homes, there was uh, ice cream parlors, uh, butcher shop produce market, uh, small grocery stores. And then you had these two or three cafes where uh, guys play cards. And during the 20s and 30s, uh, businessmen uh, would come and hire these gunmen uh, to uh, go collect their debt, or go shoot somebody, whatever. <laughs> and uh, my father is a little boy, a young boy. He would... He was a runner for the guns. When these guys, these guys would have guns hidden in the neighborhood, in the apartment building, somebody's house, and uh, they would go retrieve the gun, and give them the guns, and they had to do what they had to do. One of the most famous gunmen was Anthony, a.k.a. the Stinger, uh, Kujina. 
That guy was, you can, he was unbelievable. I did a book on him. He was the leader of the Tri-State Gang. But anyway, moving along, you know, back in those days, uh, uh, from the Italian uh, uh, heritage, you got married young, you know. Uh, you went out on a date, and then before you know it, you had to get married. And that was eight out of ten of the marriages, you know. And my mother, <clears throat> she got married at 17, and I was the second to my sister Marianne. And uh, it was one guy, Benny the Gip de Simone, gunman, who used to carry two long barrel 38s, you know, shoulder holsters. And, you know, my father was 19 at the time, so he had to go out and fend the feed us. And uh, Benny used to, you know, knock on the door. He says, <laughs> give me Georgie. Everybody call me Georgie. So I'm two years old. My mother, you know, back then, if you had any blue clothes, you know, boys dressed in blue, girls in pink. So he used to come and get me, and he'd take me to the corner, and there was an ice cream shop. And he would buy me this big ice cream cone, usually chocolate, and he'd get a kick out of me, getting it all over me. He, when he'd bring me back, my mother had to take my clothes <laughs> off, wash them. So this was going on. And there was a corner, st- uh, the corner, of course, uh, of course from uh, the ice cream place, it was called Benestock. Benestock was uh, an importer of Italian products. And it had this long, uh, I guess, I don't, I don't know, tin, tin. There was no aluminum back then. Tin awning right to the sidewalk because they used to use the sidewalk also to put goods and then they bring them in at night. So I'm, he's sitting there with me, uh, giving me the ice cream, and uh, a car j- jumps the pavement. There's three guys in the car, a driver and two shooters. The shooters uh, come out and they drill them. They kill them right in front of me. Well, I don't know. I'm just screaming. I'm baby crying. And my mother hears the shots, and she, but I'm in a, I'm in a stroller. You know, back in then, the strollers, I think, were made out of wood. <laughs> so... She runs out of the house, scoots me up, and uh, takes me in the house. Oh, of course, homicide detectives come around. All they see is the dead guy, riddled with bullets. They see ice cream, ice cream on the pavement, and this carriage. So they figured the child in that carriage or the family in that carriage has some knowledge. So, you know, they're they're banging on doors. They're talking to people. So my mother scoops me up, uh, and she takes me around the corner. It's called Sixth Street, where all the Sicilians were. My grandmother and grandfather were Sicilians, and I'm hiding there. Well, guess what? The, t- the investigation got so intensified that they moved me. Yeah, you know, I'm two years old. Two years old. They moved me from Philadelphia all the way to Wildwood, New Jersey, <laughs> where her. So I'm on the lam at two years old. <laughs> two years old, you're on the lam. I'm on the lam. They wanted to know that baby's family has a connection. So I'm, I'm on the lam at two years old. And you know, poor Benny, he, uh, he went to the, I hope he went to gangster's heaven. But then uh, that's how my life was. And uh, I can go on and on, tell you stories as a, as a child that was so interactive with the mob that, I didn't, you know, it was a way of life. Mm-hmm. Basically, it was a way of life. Well, my father's only 19 years old, and he had a nickname, Long John. He was very tall, very handsome, and uh, he didn't know what to do. My father wound up being a major gangster, major gangster on Philly and the East Coast. But back then, he's only 19 years old, and he felt uh, that he had avenged this. He, he wasn't shooting anybody back then in 19, but... He tracked down each guy that was in that car. He put, and they were men. He was only a 19-year-old kid. And he found, every time he found one, he put him in the hospital. He used his hands. He put him in the hospital. And that's how my father got the reputation as Long John. How did you get the nickname Cowboy? I hate that name. <laughs> okay. I hate that name. I hate that friggin' name. I, uh, there was some uh, Cuban friends of mine. You know, I was in the weed business, and I got so uh, good at it. When you when you get so good at something, you don't have to do anything but broker. I was a broker. I was very good at transporting. So uh, these friends of mine, Cuban friends of mine, they had a load of weed, 
in a warehouse in Houston, Texas. And they tell me the story. They had these two twin brothers, Cuban twin brothers, hardly spoke any English. They were watching the weed. You got, I think there was, oh, Christ, the 12,000 pound. Back then, 12,000 pound. Uh, Hold on, George, right there. Tell the listeners, how big was your marijuana operation? Fluctuated. Okay. It fluctuated. I can move a thousand pounds. I can move a hundred thousand pounds. Okay. It was fluctuating. Okay. So they get a hold of me and they says, these two nuts, uh, they were taking some of the weed and selling it around Houston. They're, they're not supposed to. So they wind up in a bar, a cowboy bar, and uh, they get in a shootout. Who they shoot is a Texas Ranger. Oh. They shoot the Texas Ranger. He pulls out his gun, and kills one, and and uh, the other one's arrested. So they're panicking. They haven't ratted yet the warehouse yet. So these Cuban friends of mine out of Miami, uh, they says, "Georgie, you gotta. What are we gonna do? You gotta help us." And I said, "What's the problem?" He said, "Well, we gotta get this weed into Miami." I says, "All right, no problem. I'll have it there in seventy-two hours." They said, "What?" I says, I'll have it 10 minutes, hours, but I want a thousand pound gift. Thousand pound gift back then, I could have flipped it for 300. So it's 300,000, right? So what I, what I did, well, anyway, getting back to the AKA Cowboy, which I hate. The reason they gave me that name, at that time, there were two guys that I know, Cocaine Cowboys, Wooly Falcone and Sal Makuto. Wooly got out. They were huge. They were whales. I wasn't a whale. These guys were whales. They make maybe a billion dollars, uh, cocaine and marijuana. Willie's out today. Poor Sal's still fighting to come home. So they were the cocaine cowboys. You, they have a lot of documentaries on them. So they, the FBI, my prosecutor, figured, let's throw that cowboy in then, you know. So my friend, uh, one of my friends had a junkyard down in Houston. He was a Philly guy, him and his brother. And they also had a bar it was a certain avenue. I forget that Houston, where all the strip clubs were. So uh, my, I used to have a personal lawyer back then. He worked for me only, Kevin. He don't work for me only. So I told him, you call me every other day between four and five at my friend's strip club, and we'd go over things. And I said, ask for cowboy, because the bar had 100 cowboys in it. <laughs> you know, so he says, cowboy. All the Cowboys would think this. I says, no, that's my call. But he was being, he was infiltrated by a lawyer, an FBI agent posed at a lawyer out of Miami. Back in those days, the lawyers in Miami actually got paid. A lot of them got paid in drugs, cocaine, marijuana. And they would uh, find a guy like me and say, hey, I got this load. That's, the lawyers were just as crooked as us. So, but that when I picked up the phone, that time, and they says, Cowboy, the FBI were listening, mm-hmm. and I got labeled with that name. Anyway, the, the, the gist of the story is how I got the weed into I, Jacksonville. I got it from Houston, Texas to Jacksonville. I had access to a warehouse, so I, I went and chartered a, a tinted bus, and I put chartered on it, and at the, at the junkyard, they had a kid that was really talented, with the buzzsaw. So I made him make silhouettes, uh, plywood silhouettes. And I put wigs on them and hats. <laughs> and when you looked, you thought there was passengers. <laughs> so I got one driver and I had a crash car. You have to have a crash car. It's called a crash car. So if your truck is moving with weed or your bus is moving with weed, you have to have a crash car. If the cops come on it, you have to crash into the car. So I'm driving the crash car. We got right in there, saved the load, and uh, I became a big, I became a, what you call a dark hero. <laughs> I was a dark hero. <laughs> Tell us how three diamonds in a secret pocket saved your life in Colombia when, oh, well, when you went to go where the Indians were growing the weed. Well, I don't know how I'm alive doing this interview because... My life was in jeopardy so many times, but I had my uh, clothes made with a secret pocket. And in that secret pocket, 
You're not sure, but you had the chair to open it, which always carried three diamonds. Not flawless diamonds. I'm not that stupid, but they were good diamonds. Not flawless. They were good diamonds. You know, a flawless diamond could be worth extremely a lot of money, even though it's one carat. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, I get down there, and uh, I dealt with the, uh, the Baron Kia. There was no cartels back in those days, Tommy. No? There was no cartels. It was just crews. Okay. And this was a Baron Kia crew, Baron Kia Columbia, and it was run by Raymond the Boss. So I fly in, and uh, I says, Raymond, I'm looking for some weed, Colombian gold. Oh, Georgie, we can't do it. I said, what happened? He says, well, they robbed the Indians. They cheated the Indians. The Indians grew the weed. And let me tell you something about Colombia. The Indians are in the, it was called the Santa Marta Hill, Hill region, these high hills where they grew the weed. And what made Colombian gold is really the sun baking on this marijuana plant Marijuana plant needs a lot of water, so they watered it extremely, but the sun baking it made Colombian gold. So anyway, I said, well, listen, you mean I came down here for nothing? He said, George, you want to know why we ain't going up the mountains? I says, why? He says, they send an Indian looking for certain people. He had no shoes on. He had a machete, and he found one of these guys, this crew that, well, it wasn't Raymond's crew. It was another crew that beat them. He cut his head off. Very true. Cut his head off, sat on the curve with the head and the machete until the cops came. That's how they sent a message. <laughs> Forget about the Indian that probably, back then, cut a head off in Columbia. You do a few years. The Indian comes with a, a bunch of money, and they let the guy. But he cut the guy's head off, sat it on the curve. So <laughs> my... Raymond, the boss says, we ain't going up there. I says, I'm going up there. I'm going up there. He said, he got, he thought, I think you were crazy. I said, Georgie, you ain't going to come back. <laughs> I said, I'm going up there. So I said, give me a driver. I said, give me a driver. He was, I was back then in my late 20s, 27, 28. The kid was younger than me. I says, listen, you. I forget his name, Juan, man. I says, don't have any gun in that car. Because I got to, I remember, that was the error of the FAR guerrillas. The FAR guerrillas been fighting Colombian government to take over. And the FAR guerrillas were in that area of Santa Marta region. So we're driving. We get stopped at a military checkpoint. And they go under the seat, the driver's seat, and they find a machine pistol. It's, a, it's like a little... Hang, a little hand, a handgun, but a little large with a little clip. <laughs> Shoots 40 ices. Oh, my God. They lock this up. They take it to a military compound. Very scary. And in the military compound, they had about a dozen cells on a slant, Tommy. On a slant. And in the cell was water running through each cell. They had nothing but straw. There was no cot. There was no toilet. Nothing. And that trough is where you defecated, you washed, and you drank. Oh. Now, I was smart enough not to, I, I, I defecated, <laughs> and I didn't wash or drink, because you, the only thing you survive, if you ever did anything in the jungle, is coffee. You got to drink coffee, not to get any dysentery. So I waited till the middle of the night, and I tore my little pocket, and I took out one diamond, and I held it in my hand, and I actually... He rubbed it more so he could shine. And I say, hey, hey, told the guard. And I let him see the diamond. I said, telephone, telephone. His eyes got big. He looked around. Nobody. So he takes me out of the cell. But I was smart enough to tell Raymond and his crew. I said, Raymond, you make sure guys buy the phone. Don't leave that phone. Because if I get jammed up, I need to be able to call. He said, you got it, George. You got it. So I, I, I'm dialing his phone. I'm saying, praying this. Because they told me, the Kabbadan told me before he went home, we're going to execute you in the morning. Oh. You, yes, they're going to kill you and him in the morning. You're bringing guns to, to far. We're gonna, we want to show the American government that you're involved with the guerrillas. I said, oh, my God, they're going to kill me in the morning. <laughs> and that's, that's so serious. So... Get to the phone. Finally, I got the guy. 
think his name was Hector. I says, Hector, go get Raymond. Tell him. I tell him, where am I at? I said, I'm in a military compound, such and such. And I didn't really know where, but I figured they better know where. I said, the road that you told me to take, I was on that road. And they took me to a military. I said, bring 20,000 U.S. Tomorrow morning, or I'm going to be dead. Sure enough, me and Raymond were very close. They were there, the 20,000. The same commandant that was going to execute me, now we're in his office in the morning drinking coffee and cognac. And the commandant <laughs> said, you with me now. You don't know I have to go there. I sell you all the weed. But if I didn't have that diamond, I wouldn't be doing this interview. They're going to kill you. They'll kill you and they just throw you in the jungle. <laughs> Unbelievable. Listeners, he pleaded guilty to 19 counts of drug possession and distribution. The judge put pressure on you because there was so much going on in the Philadelphia Mafia. But my question, George, is this. That judge probably shouldn't even been on the trial because didn't he testify for your, for your attorney? It's on the rarest case ever, ever in America. Well, let, let's go back. Let's take a step back. Okay. There's only two cases in America where the FBI gave you the drugs and let you sell them. So they gave me 26 pound of weed, 2,600 pound of weed. Not to me. I wasn't even in Philly at the time. They gave it to guys that worked for me and, and made us sell the drugs, which we, 2,600 pounds back then was about a little over 700,000. I'm not lying. I got my end out of it. I think I got 175 grand out of it. And the other case was Freeway Ricky Ross out of LA. They made movies about where the, where the CIA were giving Freeway Ricky Ross to cocaine, okay, and using that money to fund uh, the Contra Nicaragua movement. Okay. So there was only two cases in the books in America today. My case, when they give you the drugs, they're supposed to arrest you when you take two feet after they take with the drugs. Correct. They let us sell the drugs. Same with... Or uh, Freeway Ricky Ross. Did they figure that they were going to get you to flip and talk about the mo- the Philadelphia stuff? Oh, they, they they what they did to me is insane, insane what they did, to me. insane. But again, it's totally legal. You cannot give FBI cannot give you the drugs and you go sell it and keep the money. You're supposed to arrest you after you take two two steps away or or drive a half a block with the weed. Mm-hmm. You know, I I never did anything but weed. I had this, my guys were on tape saying about other things, but the reason I did 32 plus years is one count, CCE, Continual Criminal Enterprise for Marijuana. One count, and this is basically then from what I was reading into your case, this is a deal from Washington making an example out of you because they you didn't give them what they wanted. Well, you got to go back to the history of Philadelphia. We had three mob wars back to back. Over 80 guys killed from Philly to Newark. No arrests. No arrests. They didn't yeah. have any rats then. But they were giving out life sentences then, too. No, no. No, not no. then yet? I was the first person. Oh, you were the first one first to get the life sentence. First nonviolent offender in the history of America to get life, no parole. And I'm nonviolent. How can you give a nonviolent person? For weed. For weed. That's legal now. <laughs> so you got to remember, there was three mob wars. Me and my father survived that. We lost, I lost my godfather, Angelo Bruno. He was the boss for over 20 years. I love him. I still live by what he taught me and, uh, and uh, not evil things he taught me. And uh, they wanted, Washington is screaming. The FBI, head of the FBI in Washington is screaming at the FBI in Philly. All these bodies, you've got, no, you've got nobody rest. So me as a young knucklehead, I fall on weed and they said, that's the guy you got to squeeze, squeeze, put the ringers to squeeze. And I had a, I had a, I got the blunt of it. I got truly got the blunt of it. And I, he never ratted, folks. No, they put the cuffs on me. Oh, you got to hear the story about Costa Rica. First of all, I'm not that, I'm not that dumb, but I'm a little smart. Okay. So I know the indictment's coming down. Okay. So I had a, a friend in Costa Rica, Carlos Sarmente with an S. He was the first person 60 Minutes ever did a big series on a, the major, most major marijuana guy, Carlos Sarmente. He's 
60 Minutes did something on him, I say, in the 70s, late 70s. He was my friend. He has a big estate in Costa Rica. I was done with, I was done with Colombia. I was done with Colombia. Uh, so I needed weed, you know. And uh, I go to Costa Rica. I know I'm going to be indicted. So I go down there, and uh, I happen to Carlos meeting this uh, beautiful Costa Rican woman. I'm not going to mention her name, but her uncle was the head of the military. So when I would fly in, they picked me up with the diplomatic car with the flags. Oh, yeah. And the, and the, and the motorcade? motorcade. And I was in the car about... I, I pretty was. I probably was a little better looking back then. <laughs> so I get, and she said to me, Georgie, you're Costa Rica, one woman. You understand, one woman. And I'm saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm trying to <laughs> trying to put things together. So, uh, and I go to, first I want to touch base with Carlos. And I said, Carlos, I'm in a jam. I'm going to go through her. Uh, I, want, I don't want to mention her name. She's so beautiful. I'm going to go through her and her uncle to try to, Save myself. He said, go ahead. Go ahead. If not, don't worry. I, he had planes on his estate. Don't worry. We'll take you to another country. Don't worry. So the deal was with her, <laughs> I says, uh, I met with the uncle, and I says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up an uh, orphanage. I'm going to open up an orphanage for 500 kids. I will house, feed, and clothe them. You, as the government, will educate them. And then I had a meeting prior to all that with Children's Hospital. Children's Hospital is in, they have a Children's Hospital in Costa Rica. And I went, made a deal with you. You take care of the medical. So I'm all set up. I said, I'll have a half a million in the trust fund. And you has got to take care of me. They said, no problem. We're going to charge you with murder. I said, what? <laughs> we charge you with murder. We find dead bodies all the time. <laughs> we're going to shoot the dead body. We're going to charge you with murder. And you're, they can't extradite you for murder. We have to keep you here. And they had an apartment for me over the jail. It was great. I only went out at night. I used to actually, in the apartment over the jail, I used to put a tux on and go to this private gambling club. So I had it all gone, right? Sounds like Escobar in his jail. Oh, that's, I knew Carlo. I, guess I knew Carlo. You knew Pablo? Yeah, I did. I started weed with Carlo and Giselle de Blanco. You know who she is? Yes. The Black Widow. She yeah, was, the Black Widow. She wanted Widow. to marry me. Okay. She killed all her husbands. Yeah, she killed them all. She killed them all, but she wanted to marry me in backseat. It's a good thing you didn't. You might have been well, another back one. back in those days, <laughs> there was no cell phones. But Pablo and her had what you call, uh, I, don't, I don't know if they were safe houses. They had a bunch of houses in Kendall with landlines. And they had names for the houses, pineapple, uh, coconut. So they would call you, be at pineapple, and you go and you get a call uh, from Pablo. So uh, I get a call from Pablo. He says, that she sent him, they were both raised together. Pablo wouldn't make, he, she made all the money. Correct. She made all the gazelta. And I, I did time, uh, she did time with a jail from near me. I should talk, out of, talk to her out of my cell window. Anyway. Uh, she killed probably maybe 200 drug dealers in Miami. If you didn't buy from her, she'd kill you. <laughs> and I was very close to one of her sons. I did time with him. I love that kid. Woo, but he got killed. Anyway, so I go, Pablo, what do you want? Hey, she sent me crazy, Georgie. She <laughs> loves you. She went to Mario. <laughs> I said, Pablo, but she kills all her husband. Oh, no, that's, that's a mistake. You don't know. I said, yeah. He said, I tell you what, Georgie, I give you 1,000 kilo of cocaine. You marry her. Back then, I could have flipped it for 30, 32 million. But I didn't like powder. I seen it destroy. I didn't like it. Just didn't like it. I never did cocaine. Never did pills. When I was a kid growing up, I didn't like to drink. And then I found marijuana. And, you know, all, all teenagers go through that, that trouble time. So marijuana got me through that troubled time. So I always enjoyed marijuana. And get, get back to uh, Pablo. Uh, anyway, he tells me, calls me, and, and, uh, and basically I, I broke away. 
from them. But let me tell you, here's how I get arrested. I'm in Costa Rica, and they're going to go to war over my operation in Miami. They're really going to go to war. The Colombians and the Cubans that were dealing marijuana, they wanted Philadelphia. You know, I had Philadelphia and I had South Jersey. And this guy said, Georgia, you don't come back. There's going to be a war. They're going to, there's going to be bodies all over Miami. Please come back. Please come back. Please come back. Torture me. I said, oh, Christ almighty. So I said, all right, send a plane. So they sent a plane for me. Now, back days, back those days, we were experts on how to fly under the radar. We were experts. You know, you're flying 10 feet over the water, mm-hmm. and you're, you're going, I think it was a twin engine, Beach Baron. Twin engine Beach Baron. It's coming fast. So I go to Miami, go in his house, straighten out the war. You's got this, you's got that, but it wasn't marijuana, it was cocaine. I made the dumbest mistake. They said, oh, thank you, you come in, you do this. They had a centerfold Playboy bunny. They said, you're going to go to dinner, she's your date. Like a knucklehead, I seen her and I says, now, wait a minute, I got the plane on the tarmac. If you keep a plane on the tarmac, you have to pay. You're not right on the runway, but you're off to the side. Yeah. Uh, and we're keep we're paying to keep on because I'm gonna get I want to get the frig out of there. Uh, we go to dinner all night, and actually I had uh, enjoyed myself with the the centerfold. Yeah, the centerfold. <laughs> and I told her I said, "Listen, I'll get a hold of you, but it's not right away. In about two months, I'll reach out for you, and I'll send for you." So. Now we're having breakfast at the Hollywood Beach Hotel, just opened up, beautiful hotel. And I always tipped. I tipped everybody. It's like early in the morning. I got the plane running on the tarmac. And uh, I tipped everybody. But I forget to tip this one little hostess. I go back. I give her 10 bucks. The phone rang. Back then, a lot of people knew me as George Masters. I had ID George Masters. So the phone rings. It's this guy. I'm going to mention his name, but he was vice president of the Diplomat Hotel. His brother was president. And I always used to use his office, say a guy owed me money. Say I'm in New York or Philly or California. I used to say, hey, drop it off at uh, the vice president's office. And he had to say, sometimes it'd be 60000 20000 He's calling, but I don't know. He's been looking for me for six months working for the FBI mm. because him and his new son-in-law got jammed up in a drug case. When he mentioned my name, they said, well, let this whole case go away. We want him because I'm indicted in Philly. They're looking for me. So I should have realized, he said, I always went to his office. He said, meet me across the street at the Hitton Hotel. It should have dawned on me. I figured it's 10 minutes to there, it's 20 minutes. I says, let me grab this cash. Could have been 20, 40 grand. I, I probably need it on the run. So I go there, he's at the pool. He said, meet me at the pool bar. I walk in, he's got his suit and tie, but he's got a suit jacket over a chair. And under his arm, both arms, he was soaked down to his belt, waist belt. I looked at him right away. I told him, you rat, scum, him, bitch. As soon as I said that, the two barmaids were women. They had guns. They had girls in a pool with guns and plastic bags. You know those red laser dots? Yeah. I must have had 50 red, red <laughs> razor dots on me. But I tell you, Tommy, my honest to God truth, as a man, I'm a man's man. If I had known the torches that were waiting for me, I would have went like I was pulling the gun. They would have blew me away. I would have saved over millions and millions of dollars my kids would have had. And that was September 19th, and I, they put the cuffs on me. I didn't, didn't get out of solitary for five years later. Before I go to solitary, and I want to get there about the pencil and getting you into writing, but before I go there, <laughs> folks, there's, there, we can't even get to a, a, a fraction of the stories that Georgie has, but you're the real Con Air guy, the movie Con Air. Oh, my God. Tell, tell me how that how the hell went down. Well, I was... A, 2010, I was in Philadelphia at the, at the FDC, uh, free child facility, having my hearing. I lost. And folks, I'm talking about the movie, Con Air. If you've seen it, 
it's based well, off of you. Yeah, but I lived it. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas Cage, I'm, he comes in here, Don DeMarcos. Nicholas Cage does. I'm trying to bump in him and say, listen, Nick, look at the real con here. <laughs> right. Anyway, I lost the appeal. I'm headed back. Oklahoma, uh, they have hubs. Feds have hubs around America. And these hubs, where, uh, I think they deal 60. And any given day, ladies and gentlemen, in the skies of America, there are six. Six to eight jets full with prisoners, handcuffed and leg on, over the ears. And that is, a, that is a stop ball point. So I'm heading there, headed back to my jail in Florida. And uh, I have a habit, because I'm a convict. I know how to jail. So I know I'm going to be leaving tomorrow. So what I do, I stay up all night. I probably did 2,500 push-ups. I want to sleep. I'm going to get on the plane and we're going to go to sleep because you could be on that plane for anywhere to 8 to 16 hours, up, up, taking off, landing. So this what happens. I'm in the back of the plane. Uh, there's a little food, food galley, which they don't use, and you ain't getting no food other than a pack of crackers. And near the food galley, in the back of me, there's about 10 other guys. And I'm out. I'm sleeping because I made myself tired. I know how to jail. And... Uh, I feel something around my feet. And I looked down and my two, I had two buddies that knew me from New York. They says, there's something around your, they're trying to get something around your feet. I says, who? And I looked behind me, there's three Samayan, well, it's when the era of the Samayan, they were pirates robbing the vessels. I don't know what ocean out there in Samaya. And they got life sentences. So these nuts thinking, they're trying to, see, how do you escape and out of a plane in the air. So <laughs> I looked down, and I, I thought it was a pen, Tommy. I swear to God, I thought it was a pen. But I'm very jail-wise. It was a speed key. It's called the speed handcuff key. It's three inches long with a rubber grip. And it's a key that on, not only locks, unlocks your leg irons, it locks your handcuffs. Because when you're in transit, they got no time to be switching keys. And I says, oh, my God, it's a handcuff key. Now, the absolute policy and protocol for air marshals, there is nine air marshals on the plane. Three are armed. There's, there's hired air marshals in blue suits, but there's three in black and tan. These are expert shots. They will kill you instantly within the crowd. I know this. These so my pirates don't know that. I figure if they get that handcuff key and they, they're going to kill everybody, they're going to kill 10 or 12 of us instantly. Anybody thinks they're coming out of leg irons and handcuffs in a prison transport over America, you're not. You will be killed. And they don't understand the protocol. You know, when you go to, when you fly, when you fly regular, there's a door between you and the pilots. Mm -hmm. But in the prison plane, there's two doors. There's a door, and in that one door, there's a guy there with an automatic rifle before you get to the other door to the pilot. So you're not, they're killing everybody. Yeah. I said, I'm going to die. I said, the only shot I got is to grab it and toss it. So I went to grab it, and they're trying to, my, my wrist, they stomped on my wrist. It hurt for months. I finally get the key in my hand. I says, oh, my God. What, you, what am I going to do? I said, I got one shot. It was a little, you know, the aisle way was very narrow. I got, I got one shot, toss it into this groove. There was a little groove, and it landed perfect. I figured these nuts are going to still try, so I told one of the marshals, I says, get your key. Right? Worst thing I ever did. They came. After they got the key, they said, who told you about the key? They said, me. They grabbed me out of the seat, took me to the front of the plane, and when you're unruly on an air and a, and a prisoner, they have a, they have this thing uh, like a roll, a roll like where fire hose. You know them rolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like it's a circle Velcro, roll. and they slap it to your seat, and they wrap it around you, and they put a hood over me. I said, Oh my God, what's the sense? I got to ride with it. No sense. I got to ride with it. So I have was had a Velcro to the seat. Thank God I didn't soil myself. 
And then they put a hood over my head. You're in total darkness. And we landed. I knew. I was the first name to be called. Who's waiting for me? The FBI. They grab me. They take me to this little obscure jail. Can It's got an Indian name with a K in Oklahoma. And he put me in a cell. Put me in a hole. You got to ride with it. I figured sooner, but my two friends really picked up for me. They said, well, no, no, that guy. And about, I'm in the hole about two days. Finally, the marshals, not the FBI, the marshals there came and got me. So we know what happened, Mark Toronto. Uh, we, we're going to continue your transport. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I want that in my, when you, when a prisoner travels, you have a, a, a travel jacket. It's not your complete file. Just a small file. I said, I want it in my file. I want my warden to know what I did. So I finally get back to my jail in Florida. And who's, you know, these cops know me. I graduated over 8,000 inmate students, so they know me. See, George, we heard about it. We heard about it. And as a story I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, my intake, you don't enter a prison. It's called R&D, Okay. Receiving and departure. You're not going in a prison unless you go through. Our, everybody's in. They want to know the story. So I said, all I want to know if it's in my jacket, that I can use it. it wasn't in, they lied to me. Oh. It wasn't in my jacket. You know, Tommy, you know how long it took me? Four years to get the report. You know why? Because that guy that dropped the key, I don't know who the name, he would have lost his job and his pension. For dropping that key. But they waited till he retired and got, and then they, I finally got the report. It took four years. <laughs> Listeners, he's a prolific writer. He's written over 30 books, numerous short stories, screenplays, poems. You were kept in a boxcar cell for two weeks, no lights, no heat, no bed. Well, how did, tell me about the pencil where you started writing. Well, you got to understand. I was at Marion, Illinois, the most maximum security in, in, in the United States. It was in... That's where Gotti uh, died. It was South, South Central Illinois. I got there a month, I think it was a month, maybe a month after they killed two guards. They butchered two guards. They forget about butchering the other. They don't care about you butchering each other. They butchered two guards. So just so happens that I, one of my co-defendants, co his name was Tommy, he was on a run. And they, he fell off a roof of his cabin in the mountains in Pennsylvania, and he broke his leg. Anyway, they captured him. He needed a favor from me. He needed me to come back to the courtroom and take the fifth. If I took the fifth, they couldn't use a lot of damaging evidence against him. So what am I going to do, not do it? So I'm going back, and every jail I hit, they treated me horribly because they figured I'm an animal, that I'm a, I'm a guard killer. But they you're a nonviolent up, offender. They didn't care. As long as you said, Marion, that was the jail I left, and that's the jail I'm coming back. And they, they got me chained up, and uh, I'm going through the jail, and all of a sudden the steel door is open, and I'm going to the basement, and I smell... Must see, you know, like this, this area hasn't been used. They throw me in a boxcar cell, which are illegal. They're totally illegal because in a boxcar cell, there's no toilet. There's no toilet, okay? There's not a sink, okay? There's a hole in the floor with a clutch, like a car clutch, mm -hmm. and that's where, the, where you would defecate or, uh, you know, relieve yourself, and you clutch the clutch. They throw me in there, and there's a, a string with a wire, you know, with one bulb. I was in the second day, the bulb went out. The bulb went out. And I'm saying, they fed you, it's two steel doors, and there's, there's a slot with a flap. And they push the tray with the stick like you're an animal in the zoo. That's how you push the food in. So once you pass the first slot and the second, you get a little light. But I don't know. I never jailed in a boxcar cell. I never jailed with a hole in the floor. Now, what's come now after their while, you know, a prisoner knows what to do. You try to save your bread. Uh, maybe you got an apple. You don't eat all your food. You're smart enough to save your food. But I didn't know rats came out of that, that friggin' hole. 
Tommy, I fought rats for two days, two nights, fighting rats. And the only way I fought them was my bus shoes. And it's dark. I only see them when they were right up on me. And let me tell you something. When there's more than one rat, they ain't scared. I fought these rats. Finally, I t- I'm screaming for light, begging for light, crying for light. I says, one cop, one cop. And I'm on my hands and knees, and I'm saying, listen, I'm exhausted. I haven't slept in two days. I'm fighting rats. I need a bucket. Just give me a bucket so I can survive. For some reason, I touched this guy. And he cracked the door. I couldn't even see him hitting me the bucket because the light was blinding me. I'd been in the dark. So he gives me the bucket. I put the bucket on top of the hole, and basically that, that stopped the rats. But I was losing my mind. The worst thing... I challenge anybody listening to this show, okay? I want you to go in your closet, no watch, no light, and sit there for an hour. Imagine it like day after day after day. You got to be going crazy. One day I was bending down. I, you hear sound is very important in prison. Sounds, you know sounds. You know guards' keys, and I know the food's coming. I'm down on my hands and knees. I got a little bit of light, and I... Notice something, some kind of ledge. Okay. And I see this pencil. And it was a short pencil, but it was a very high, tense lead. It was like maybe three, four inch pencil. And I got the pencil. I'm losing my mind. They're not giving me a bulb. I don't know how long. I think it was like a holiday. You don't want to get caught in holidays in transit because you ain't going nowhere. And I start writing. I start writing. Curse words, mad. Writing where? On the walls? The on floor? On the walls. The floor, every, just writing. And that's how, that's how, ladies and gentlemen, that's how writer uh, was born. And in the course of my incarceration, I can honestly say that I had written over two million words. But if it wasn't for that pencil, I would have lost my mind, literally lost my mind. When they finally take me out, I don't know, two weeks later, I don't know why they wouldn't give me a light bulb. They just hated marrying prisoners. We were considered guard killers. And uh, when they finally let me out, you know, they chained you up before you even step out of the cell, chained behind my back. And I couldn't even use my arm to cover my eyes because the blight was blinding me. So I'm, I'm closing my eyes. And I hear one guard, that son of a bitch rode all over the effing cell. <laughs> and that's how Ryder was born. And you were you were a bit of it's been do, well documented. You're a model prisoner. You have written different books, classes. I you've did thirty two plus years and never had an incident report. I mean, you've done so many programs, but the one I really want to hear about that really hit me was the um, one about the fathers, fathers behind bars, fathers behind bars. I'm so proud of that, Tommy. It's still going on. Uh, where we took estranged fathers from their children. You got to understand, you know, a lot of these, you know, minority type inmates, the woman moves on. And he might have two children with her and she moved on. And I was very proud of that class. And what we did, you had a, I was very, uh, I was no nonsense teacher. Don't, you don't come in my class and think you're just going to sit there to get a certificate. Now you're disrespecting me. You, know, you don't want to disrespect me in prison. So, but you had to choose, had to have two things. You had to be have a GED, or you had to be enrolled in a GED to show me that you're trying to change yourself. And you had to write a letter to yourself, how to be a better father, and read it in front of the class. And mm. I did that class for several years, Tommy. Not one, one guy wrote a letter, and some of them were pretty tough guys. Never made it through without choking up. Never made it through. So, and one of my proudest things was the, the first ever fathers and daughter dance. Oh. Oh, uh, in, the, in the visiting room. Now, the son, if you if you had an eight-year-old girl and she had a seven, naturally you take the boy too. Sure. But the most, I, I had to help, I, I had to help back from not shedding tears to see this little girl first time with the father that she hasn't probably seen. And the father's behind bars. And my other class was very proud of it. It's still going on. How to start a business for $1,000 or less. 
you got these guys doing 20 years. You know, you know what they give you after doing 20 years? I would. I lost count how many times I go to the ward. But come on, ward. And the guy did 20 years. Give him $250. To get $500 would be like crazy. And these, how do you start your whole life after 20 years with $250? First, you go to the halfway house. You can't leave the halfway house to get a job unless you have ID. Mm. Okay, you have to have a certificate or you had to have a driver's license. You had to have money. Take a cab. That's we do wrong in this country. If you if you research countries, incarceration, Sweden, uh, Switzerland, uh, Denmark, their incarceration is way different, way different, way you huma- more humane. How did you? <laughs> you said you know you're lucky to be here, but how did you survive when you had a workout buddy that had cut an inmate's head off? He cut a guard's head off. Oh he my cut buddy, a, a cut, home. A cut a psychologist's you know, head off. I don't really know if his name's Daryl Holmes. <laughs> he just went he by was Darryl. a Colorado state prisoner. When he was 17 year old, he was homeless. And for some reason, a guy beat him up. So he, he goes and gets a brick. And he gets a beat cop and hits the head with the brick. Takes his gun. Tracks down the guy, kills him in an arcade, and pees on him. <laughs> so he gets life in the Colorado system, state system. While he's there, he evolved. He evolved. And I know he cut an inmate's head off first, and he waited to this guard. I don't know how he got it. The guard was in the men's room, went there and cut his heads off. So now... He's, he was, uh, John Voight did a movie called Runaway Train, and the movie starts with John Voight is welded in the cell. Yeah. That's, that's Daryl Holmes' story. They welded him in his cell. So there was a psychologist from Colorado was very wealthy. His family had connections. The governor gives him the okay to go in that prison and, uh, Study Daryl Holmes. So he goes to Daryl. He's welded in. He says, I'm going to unweld you. I want to speak with you, interview you. We're going to do a whole program around you. Daryl said one sentence to him. Leave me alone. Anyway, they unwelded the cell. They put Daryl in some cell somewhere. And Daryl was on a 10-man hold. That means every time he came out to sell, there's 10, he's chained, he's leg iron and chained behind his back. He's got 10 guards with steel batons. I was on a four-man hold in Marion. I went from a four-man hold to a two-man hold. And I was nonviolent, so I know about that. Every time Daryl came out to the cell, and they escorted him to this office that the prison had to provide for the psychologist who was very connected. I don't know his name. I used to know his name. And anyway, fast forward. In a, in a course of a year, he went from a 10-man hole with the psychologist's order to a two-man hole. When he got to a two-man hole, you know, they take the cuffs off and they let him in the psychologist. And he told the psychologist, I'll call you when I need. Come back. When they came back, his head was on the desk after a year. <laughs> and you know what Daryl told? I told him when I first met him to leave me alone. <laughs> so how did you get... Working out with this guy. Well, wait a minute. Now, if you work for the Bureau of Prisons in the psychology department, you every psychologist has to study Daryl's home dossier. Because he, this guy was so educated and so renowned as a psychologist, Daryl got into his head. And every... Uh, that was with Dr. Willis in the one jail I was at in Mariana, Florida. Every time he had free time, I said, Martirano, I say over the loudspeaker, Martirano, port to Dr. Willis' office. That's all he wanted to talk about. You mean you really knew him? This and that. <laughs> what was this? He wanted to know everything. Anyway, in Marion, uh, you're, you, they crack five cells at a time. You get out an hour. And that hour, you can do your shower, you can do your workout, 
They're only out for an hour. It just so happens Daryl lived next to me, so when they cracked my cell, they cracked his cell, and and I would notice only time me and him would come out. I don't know why these other guys wouldn't come out. And I had a couple of friends. I don't know if you ever heard Margolis. They made two movies about him. The CBS, CBS Murders. I don't think I've seen them. It's, yeah. They, uh, they just did more reason. Top actor. Just, anyway, like long story short, we're working out. And uh, we're doing what called burpees, but the burpees went into killer jokes. The reason they're telling killer burpee is a very strenuous workout. You do a burpee, you do a squat, you do a push-up. And we were doing them for, you know, you had to get your shower. We were going maybe 30 minutes. I mean, it's a hard workout. One Mexican guy, it just so happens, a new Mexican guy came into a third cell, and he uh, he was doing a lot of time. He was, a, he was with the Mexican mob. Joe, he said, I, I'm going to work out with you guys. We said, all right. So we worked out. He gets a heart attack. He dies <laughs> while we're working out. So I looked at Daryl. I said, listen, I don't want to lose my wreck. So we leaned him up against the wall. And I went to another side. You got sunglasses? And I put sunglasses on him. And he's sitting there dead. And it's we like finished our workout. Parties. We finished our workout. So now they crack your cell. And you got, it. you got 30 seconds to get in that cell. But Joe's dead. So we created Killer Joe's. Until today, Tommy, all around the federal system, that name is still going. Anyway, me and Dallas, well, I had, when I hit that jail, I was in other jails, and I had a lot of property, you know, sweatsuits, sneakers, and I didn't need all that. So I didn't own them, and I had a beautiful, I had two Christian Dior jogging suits. Mm-hmm. Very expensive. You know, they're jogging suits with a zipper in mm-hmm. your pants. So I said, hey, buddy, uh, you could reach. You could reach to his cell. And he could his arm. I said, listen, I don't need this. So I gave him a Christian day or a suit. suit. Very expensive, maybe 200 bucks. And, I, and he says, I don't hear from him. He says, you're giving me this? He says, yeah, you could have it. And I got a pair of sneakers. I'm just trying, but I didn't know he had none of that compassion since he's 17. So we and him started getting real close. So I remember one, the warden makes the rounds at once a week, every cell block. That's mandatory. <laughs> so the warden comes by, and I hear that. There's open bars, you know. Barrel, <laughs> so I said, warden, I've been here three years. I did your programming. You didn't cause any trouble. I want to go back to the Colorado state system because he has a court order that he can't be welded in anymore. He wants to be in population. He says, if I'm not out of here in two weeks, a head's coming off. It could be your head. It could be a guard's head. It could be somebody in the cell block. A head's coming off. Now, you can get your goon squad. You can search the cell. You ain't going to find a knife. I'm telling you, a head's coming off. Warden listens to him, goes away. Ten minutes later, our cell's cracked. I put a towel around my neck. <laughs> you know, we're working out. I put a towel. That's the first time I really seen him laugh. He said, Georgie, let me tell you, your head's never going to come off. <laughs> You're the only friend I have. <laughs> I said, there, geez, now I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> anyway, that was on a Friday. The warden comes Saturday morning with his leisure clothes on. You know, always suit and tie. He said, Daryl, but he's not near the bars. He's... He's four feet away. He said, Daryl, I spoke to the governor of Colorado. Please, I'll have you out of here in two weeks. What they do with you in Colorado is their business. Please don't do anything. And sure enough, two weeks later, he was gone. But he was, he was about 5'11". He looked like the actor Peter O'Toole. Mm. But he was very deadly with martial arts. He used, to, he used to put a sheet, just a blanket, up against a stone wall. And what he used to do with his hands with that blanket, can't imagine. He's never getting out. He don't know anything. That was Daryl Holmes. <laughs> Looking back, you wonder how you made it through? You know, God looked out for me in mysterious ways. 
I'd never been in jail before. I never had a traffic ticket. I wind up with the worst prisoners, with the worst gangs. You had the Aryan Brotherhood, which I knew, Barry Mills, T.D. Bingham. They, you can see them. They made a big documentary on them. These guys, when, uh, Barry Mills ordered the killing of 40, 40 inmates. He sent an order out, and there you get killed. The Mexican Mafia, they made a movie, American Me. Uh, American Me. These were all the, and they controlled all these other prisons. If they send word out to kill this guy, you're getting killed. <laughs> Barry Mills, you couldn't leave Marion. You don't leave Marion unless you hit the honor block. And once you do three years, you have to go to the honor block. But the warden, if they designate you to a penitentiary, the warden of that penitentiary has the right to turn you down. And Barry Mills, T.D. Bingham, Black Bob, Champ, they know they're not going to be accepted. So they get to the honor block for a while, and then they'll screw up. Then they have to go recycle all again. And I was smart. Barry, me and Barry knew each other. So I'm, I'm designated to Leavenworth. I'm going. Barry calls me in the cell. He says, Georgie, I need you to give a message. I says, hey, Barry, F you. <laughs> I ain't giving no kill message. He knows I'm not a rat. He's giving a, he wants to give me a kill message. He's the guy that ordered, there was a, I think two guys killed in Lewisburg from his, that I knew he gave the message to kill. I'm not giving no kill order. It's no bad. I'm trying to go home. I ain't giving no kill message for you. And some years went by and some young, aspiring prosecutor creates a big indictment out of L.A., and they bring all the Aryan Brotherhood. They're all doing life. as this big case. And they all got life again. I mean, it was just, the guy was probably trying to enhance his career. But the, ladies and gentlemen, you can see, just go to uh, your TV remote and say, uh, Aryan Brotherhood, Barry Mills, T.D. Bim, Mexican Mafia. I mean, <laughs> these guys. <laughs> I'm there, non the first offender. So, when I finally leave Marion, they send word out to all these prisons. Georgie's with us. Anybody bothers him, they got the Mexican Mafia, the Aryan Brotherhood, the guerrilla movement out of D.C. <laughs> so I hit the jail, not so I get around the Italian guys. They said, what the fuck are you? You got all this power. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say, God looks out for you in mysterious ways. But I never abused the power. I honestly can say I did nothing but help. Prisoners. Listeners, if you want to know what he's doing now, go to thegrowfather.com. You can check it out. He has his own beer. One of them is an IPA with his actual mugshot on the can. How's the Growfather business? Well, uh, the Growfather site, ladies and gentlemen, uh, will probably be up in about a week. My, my cannabis industry, my beer, uh, your know, beers, you can see at Berlin Breweries. You can uh, uh, go to Berlin Breweries in New Jersey. And what I'm most proud of, Tommy, is that I create jobs. And before I die, I'm 74, I'm in good shape. But before I die, I want to create at least a couple thousand jobs that are going on, that are going on forever, but people can have lives, pay their bills, raise their children. I'm really adamant about that. I think that's the best legacy I can give to myself, by creating jobs. for Right now, I have about 40 people working for me. I'm very proud of that. I want to thank Al here at Dom DeMarco's for allowing us to sit here and talk and do this interview. People, seriously, you got to come to Dom DeMarco's Pizza, the happy hour, the pizza, the pasta. You are not going to go wrong. I'll put a link in the show notes. You have to check this place out. George, thanks for your time and coming on the show. Well, I'm by coastal I live two months here, two months fully in New York. So hopefully if you come in and I'm here, just ask for me. I'd be happy to sit down Bring kids. I love kids. I love kids. I love hanging out with kids. There you go. You heard it. Do me a favor, though, people. Rate and review my show. Five stars. Nice comments. You know how long it's going to take you? Less than 30 seconds of your day to do that. And it helps me grow my show immensely. We're in over 100 countries. I want to continue to grow it. I want to continue to move this podcast forward. But I need your help to go five stars. Nice comments to help me grow One the show. One last thing. hope you bring me back. Because I'm yes. involved. You know, I'm a writer, prolific writer. 
I wrote over each other. But I haven't written my life story because it's some, it does not seem to end. But someday I'm going to write it. But uh, like I said, uh, I think I think the one sentence that I I like I one sentence I live by right now it's it's a little bit callous. I live I live by no aggravation because if you have aggravation you can't accomplish the good things. Mm-hmm. So I try to do the best best I can with the little I have right now. Very important, Tommy, very important. I've been talking for years, ladies and gentlemen, how to stop the violence in the East Coast cities, New York. Philly's very violent, gun violence. I'm meeting with the new mayor, and I'm starting a cannabis for guns program. I've been preaching for years. These kids on the streets with these guns, they're not going to give you no gun for a $100 gift certificate to Target's or a $100 bill. They're not going to give it. But I will give them a half a pound of good weed. Good weed to take the gun. Take the guns. And I have this. Finally got a mayor that wants to work with me. I hope you get that through. And definitely going to bring you back because we only hit oh, a I scratch. Want to come back. I we want only, to come we back. only hit a scratch of the I surface. I want to come back. Well, hopefully when I come back, my Cannabis for Guns program will be working and helping. Because we have to do innovative stuff, new stuff. Because nothing's working. Mm-hmm. Nothing's working. I think right here in Vegas, uh, I hate to say it, they had their first flash mob. Right here in downtown uh, Summerlin. Summerlin, yeah. Crown Center. And and the people I've been talking to last week are very nervous about that. I said, what are you nervous about that? We have it every week in Philly. <laughs> we have a flash mob every week. <laughs> George, man, you're the best. Thanks for coming on, man. My pleasure. My pleasure. I hope to continue. Uh, like I said, hopefully when I sit down, my other program will be implemented and we'll be helping a lot of Take a lot of these guns off the street. And with that, folks, that's going to do it for this episode of Before the Lights. I'm your host, Tommy Canale. Until next time, everybody, I salute a chin chin. Very good interview, Tommy. I think, I think we got the message out.